So the topic uh, that I chose today was uh, humanitarian governance, accountability, localization, and MEW, um, and what role MEW could play in changing realities. And the thing is, I chose these topics uh, because even though uh, they're often discussed uh, separately, especially in, in the public debates, uh, and they have maybe different timelines of development, they are well, co-constitutive. -con uh, and also from my own research and experience, uh, I thought the interconnectedness is actually key. Uh, I was studying humanitarian governance in post-conflict settings, uh, which generally also include multi-mandated organizations centered around the state with the humanitarian governments in a broad sense and a diversity of actors that are actually negotiating aid outcomes. And in all my cases, there were ambitions to strengthen a more locally led response. And in all my cases, both the locally led and the accountability were experienced as the most challenging processes. And at the same time, as part of humanitarian practice, monitoring, evaluation and learning has become an integral part of humanitarian governance as well, to keep track of uh, progress and to me measure progress, uh, to keep track of the quality, to be more accountable, to inform this decision making. Uh, however, and unfortunately, meal practices are often defined by the humanitarian government governance more in a narrow and top down sense, and also risks to reinforce the current power structures rather to be more of a tool mm -hmm. of reflexivity and change. And to understand better how humanitarian governance, accountability, localization, and meal are intertwined, I'll briefly discuss them separately, making co connections along the way, and thinking aloud about the role meal could be playing in, in bringing about change, uh, and also very much welcoming more ideas <laughs> around this topic because this is work in progress. Um, and of course, these uh, topics and the connectedness is not new. People have been writing about this for decades already. Uh, but that it still hasn't really brought about change probably also says a lot about well what is and what is not happening uh, currently. So for humanitarian governance, uh, humanitarian governance, as also T.I. Hilhorst has described, uh, developed for a more classic Dunantes paradigm to more resilience humanitarianism. So taking also a longer term perspective, focusing on resilience versus vulnerabilities. And this also includes a shift in seeing crises as ah, exceptional to more crises as normal. And this also opens up the focus of who acts within the humanitarian arena. So it's not only humanitarian, international humanitarian NGOs, but the diversity of actors from the affected populations as first responders to civil society, religious institutions, local and national authorities, private sector, well, we can go on. And moving away from a more top-down perspective, where the international gaze is increasingly being questioned, um, that is where we are at at the moment. But this also raises the question of what is actually good governance? What is good humanitarian governance? If you're talking about governance in general, um, you know, an example of good governance is the, well, not the example of good governance, but the Council of Europe also has examples of good governance and they have, for example, 12 principles among which participation, effectiveness, transparency, responsiveness, ethics, innovation are all part of, which sounds like the discussions we also have in the humanitarian sector. And the World Humanitarian Summit uh, was kind of a culminating moment for this, uh, for humanitarian governance, where various commitments were made that promised changes to address part of these critiques on the humanitarian system. But the shift in power has neither really been easy nor straightforward. And I see a lot of focus on the addition of policies and practices instead of actual changes to the system. So, and you can see that in meal as well with the gathering of more information on progress towards newly defined goals, but not necessarily the information on gathering or thinking about the process to get there uh, that is based on the original frameworks. This is particularly noticeable in accountability and localization, which are often on the top of the challenges list. Um, but still, that doesn't mean that change has been stagnant, right? So for accountability, the humanitarian quality standards, they have been developing since the 1990s, especially uh, in 2014, we have the CHS, 
uh, but often these are still kind of seen as upwards donor accountability. Um, but how can we move them perhaps more to, to even an ethical framework to stick with uh, the, the topic also of the new research agenda? So our ethical duty towards affected populations. So accountability, as you know, has different dimensions, uh, which give more weight, some of which are well, having more weight than over others. So accountability can be narrow, which is in invited spaces and a focus on more technocratic uh, mechanisms. It can be broad, which includes more informal forms and based on the principle of humanity. It has different directions of, of accountability. It is vertical, upwards, downwards, it's horizontal, internal, external, and it has different types. So taking account, giving account, um, and being held to account or responsibility. Uh, but taking account is often done in the more narrow sense by gathering information, consultations. Giving account in practice often translates more into these technocratically based mechanisms uh, and complicated information systems that do not always integrate with national or local ones. Uh, and being held to account is even more difficult. And this is partly due to this narrow focus of taking account of this more, well, extractive information instead of really participation in decision making, uh, giving account that's more reactive than proactive. Um, and it is not always working in the way that responsibility is followed up on. So being held to account also requires a certain degree of acceptance of others to hold you accountable. Uh, and in that way, internal accountability mechanism standards and practices, although they are very necessary uh, and have definitely made progress, are not, not always sufficient. And we, we've seen cases uh, 2018 in Haiti um, and other cases where it, it, it's proven to be difficult and internal systems haven't been able to resolve them. And oftentimes it's related also to these internal power dynamics that, that block it. And even initiatives of more horizontal accountability uh, bring challenges. So in, in Sierra Leone, for example, I saw an NGO with information kiosks. And although they were more focused on information sharing and giving accounts, uh, they would also collect feedback as it came in, regardless of the project. But when complaints were referred, uh, there was also usually no follow-up on the action. And the power imbalances of the current system make it really difficult to be held accountable, and especially in a desired shift towards more locally led uh, humanitarian governance. And this is also where the bridge to localization is made. Uh, there's always an assumption that if aid responses are more locally led, that they're also more accountable. But this is actually not necessarily the case, I would argue. And mostly because that there exist many differences and diversities among local actors, as it is with international actors or any kind of actor. Uh, or any category that we're talking about, there's much diversity. And I've previously talked about uh, the multiple dimensions of how the local, and quote unquote, uh, is constructed. And the main constructions that were relevant to my research at the, at the time, they were the local being seen as local, as governments, and as legitimation. And this lens also has consequences for accountability. So if the local is seen as local with a certain affected population in a certain area, different local actors are present, but not all are equally representative of another and have different power relationships. So how then do you deal with that in accountability to affected population, downwards accountability, in your complaint response mechanisms? Local governance is equally challenging as multiple levels of local governance are always also interacting with each other. They can be at odds with each other. Uh, for example, the community level governance versus the national governance, but even inter interstate uh, challenges that are there. And this again affects horizontal accountability and also upwards accountability to the state. I mean, who are you accountable to then? Um, and there's this risk of localization being a legitimate legitimation tool. And this is also the case for accountability. Uh, so taking account from and giving account to certain local actors does not mean that an organization is accountable. 
So local power dynamics affect accountability as well, with certain groups being able to raise their voice louder or having leverage to hold others accountable. Uh, in some cases, this, this could be national states, but other groups might not have the same power. For example, the affected communities. And when there are meetings within the humanitarian sector, there's generally a consensus that localization must be done. It's a good thing, uh, but progress generally also is still slow. And it seems that there remains a different expectation of what localization looks like and what is needed. Um, and the local as defined by well, international standards, actors, frameworks, uh, generally also reproduces a certain type of local on the ground, but it leaves little space for to really promote locally led responses. Um, so although these critiques on, on power and, and politics have in part in debate of, of the debate of humanitarian governance, uh, the connection of localization accountabilities also now in the public uh, debate is tied to questions of decoloniality in the humanitarian sector. And that discussion is then, well, relatively new, I would say, for the humanitarian field. But again, um, development scholars uh, have, have obviously a long history uh, with this as well, which uh, we could take into account. Now, I see, I do see a larger role for meal and then especially the kind of evaluation, uh, accountability learning part of the, of the meal uh, to potentially bridge some of the divides but then it would need to evolve as well. So there have been account developments um, for meal that take a more holistic approach. And in the development sector, uh, evaluation and learning has been established quite a lot earlier and has been more participatory. Uh, you could see that in the participatory rule appraisal, participatory learning action. All of these have been, uh, well, already quite started quite uh, quite longer and from the 1990s onwards uh, evaluations also became more common in humanitarian practice although these initially were not very connected to theory and reflection uh, and often were based on kind of preset structure so there would be a document review high level meetings short visit to the affected country where again uh, most of the time we would stay in NGO offices and have a very brief visit uh, to the affected com communities. There have also been some developments in terms of the, the quality criteria for evaluations, such as the, the DAC evaluation criteria, for example, they've become quite mainstream, uh, but they are also not really applied in a very systematic manner, uh, but especially without really a focus on the learning parts of it. And that obviously is always a shame. Um, so it was more looking at the what, so the outputs, uh, and not really the, the why or the, the relations. And most of these evaluations centered around a single project, single agencies, with only a few joint uh, evaluations and follow-up evaluations. Uh, but there has been obviously a move towards more a professionalization of evaluation and learning, uh, the establishment of uh, ALNAP, Active Learning Network for Accountability and Humanitarian Action is, is part of that. And these uh, came up also after the joint evaluation of Rwanda, which was, I think, quite a, quite a milestone in the humanitarian history. And in the last years, we've also seen a move towards more experimental reviews, real-time reviews, participatory approaches, uh, and also bottom-up initiatives that are trying to bring the change uh, in the way that progress is measured, such as the, the NEAR uh, network. So MEAL is also affected by these global developments and critiques on humanitarian governance in general, such as on accountability and localization. And some organizations have embraced a stronger focus on institutional learning. Uh, and this has been reflected in the resources directed to it. But overall, MEAL practices have also struggled to catch up. Um, there have been some opportunities to capitalize on. Like I said, the number of large scale humanitarian response events have brought out uh, different evaluations that were conducted around them. Uh, and these have contributed to changes such as 
well, 1980s famine response, 90s Rwanda, uh, 2000 tsunami, Haitian earthquake, 2010 Ebola responses more recently. But too often the more regular and standard evaluations uh, are focused on outputs and, uh, and upwards accountability. Others, another challenge is to not kind of practice what you preach, such as evaluations or meta evaluations on localization, on accountability that do not include um, non English literature or reports or participation from affected populations or local NGOs. So institutions are notoriously difficult to change in general, not just humanitarian. Um, humanitarian governance is still having an international center of gravity. And international actors have, well, historically kind of set the agenda, which also defined what capacity means, how a good response should look like, etc. And with this, the, the parameters for collaboration are also predefined uh, and others are kind of made to fit in it. Um, within which, so you, you define the parameters, you measure it, uh, and you measure if you said what you would do, you would actually have done or not. So it's not very transformatory <laughs> in that sense, if you would really want to change the system. And then resources and authorities are also redistributed accordingly, and really outside voices and actors are not given too much weight. Um, there is a technical focus and the risk of bureaucracy in meal as it is done now. So there's the example of collection of information and data for the sake of collecting uh, or for upward accountability, but not really for learning. And can it really move away from this kind of more check, checking the boxes exercise to more, to more of a tool of transformation? Um, I do think so, but there <laughs> need to be some things I think that are underpinning that. So there is a need, I think, for an acceptance by practitioners that humanitarian practice and what quality means or good practice means is constructed. And it can be interpreted and prioritized differently by different actors. And because of this construction, there is the need to also reimagine uh, something that goes beyond the silos uh, as they are now, because the quality of aid is not only dependent on the internal adherence to, to standards, but also how aid is negotiated with all other actors. So it is highly relational, but you don't always see this in, uh, in meal or evaluations or in learning. So it requires an increased focus on the relational aspects of aid uh, and processes in general. So less on the outputs, also more on the why. And if humanitarian governance is to adapt, uh, processes of adaptability need to be central to learning. And it requires a reflection about one's own, own weaknesses and systematic inequalities. So the construction of quality makes the, bridge, the bridging of theory and practice very important. So to stimulate learning from academic research around the globe, uh, to adjust the frameworks that uh, humanitarians we <laughs> use. Uh, for example, well, I can also, sounds a bit strange to have my own example, but the concept of the, of the multi-local could be too theoretical for some, but it also offers a lens to understand the impact of practices on a broader range of local actors and their interrelationships, which are often overlooked. But the question is not only about the what we are looking at, but it's also about how we are doing it. So the process of meal itself. The level of control that takes the lead in, in these meal practices also determines how it will be done uh, and what will be the limitation on the outcomes. So if it's only top down, that generally reinforces also some predetermined views. Uh, and the renegotiation of these processes and the renegotiation of the level where the center of gravity is, is also important. And like I said, like framing and discourses, they, they matter, and knowledge co-creation is therefore also crucial. Um, and this also means being aware and open about your own biases, not just on a personal level, as a, as a meal practitioner, but also on an institutional one. So how is your organization actually fitting within a larger framework? Um, there have been initiatives and ideas to do it differently, and these can consist of inclusive 
advisory groups or connecting to more local knowledge institutions that take a more bottom-up approach to evaluation and learning. There are also obviously, what I said before, the more decolonial approaches where we can learn a lot from, which put a strong emphasis also on challenging the preconceived conceptions of both well, the aim of the evaluation or learning and the evaluators or the real practitioner, practitioners themselves, and allowing Neil also to be inspired by different worldviews. And also making sure that well, information and learning is used, not only in the offices, but also by other, uh, by other stakeholders in the humanitarian governments. So it's really living a learning a cult and culture, <laughs> living learning and culture amongst humanitarian actors. So this is crucial for coming back to holding humanitarian actors responsible, which is very challenging uh, for, for everyone. And this needs to be based on understanding of why and, and how certain actions had certain consequences for certain actors. So we need to bring back the nuance uh, in what we do and providing evidence to that case. So for accountability in the broad sense, Neil can be more than a tool uh, for reporting and transparency, because learning is actually the cornerstone for taking responsibility. As to be able to take responsibility, we also need to understand what went well, what went wrong, for whom, uh, differentiation between different actors uh, and how to change it. And for this, we also need to unlearn and relearn <laughs> what, uh, what we have learned before. So I, I'm also very curious what your own experience uh, has been on this. And you know, how do you see Emil in relation to accountability and localization within the larger framework of humanitarian governance? Can it actually be a tool for change within the current system or is, uh, is something else needed? 